Oil is not just a crucial commodity that is used to power every country and run the entire global economy. It's also used frequently as a geopolitical weapon. That is to say that the price of oil and the supply of oil in the global market is used to serve the political and economic interests of particular countries, largely oil producers. Now, I'm Ben Norton here at Multipolarista, and I did a recent interview discussion with a friend of mine, Aaron Good, who's a historian and political scientist, and we talked about some of that history of how oil is used as a geopolitical weapon, specifically by the United States and its top ally, Saudi Arabia. We discussed the 1973 oil embargo and some other important history. Now, I will link to that in the description below. That, that was a, a fun discussion. I think we had a, a lot of great analysis in there. But what I wanted to do today is, is focus in particular on 2014. In 2014, the United States and Saudi Arabia, which at the time was basically a U.S. proxy regime, orchestrated a massive oil crash, intentionally overproducing oil and underselling oil, or that is selling oil below the market value in order to drastically drop the price of oil. It eventually dropped in 2014 by three quarters. And the reality is that this was an intentional political strategy by the United States to hurt Russia, Iran, and Venezuela. I talked about this a little bit in the discussion I had with Aaron Good, the historian, but I wanted to go into greater detail and I wanted to show concrete evidence from mainstream corporate media outlets that show that this is not some crazy conspiracy theory. That term is often used, it's thrown out there to discredit people who point out that the US government engages in conspiracies in order to undermine and attack and destabilize its adversaries specifically countries like Russia, Iran, and Venezuela, countries where the U.S. has imposed brutal sanctions, countries where the United States has repeatedly tried to organize coups, violent coups d'etat, and color revolutions and regime change operations. And, of course, if, you're going, if the U.S. is going to try to overthrow a foreign government, it's also going to, to use anything at its disposal up to and including oil and global markets and the global financial system dominated by Wall Street, by U.S. corporations. So let me talk about this very important historical episode back in 2014. And I'm going to start by looking at a few mainstream media outlets, including, I'll start here with Reuters. Now, in 2014, the U.S. president was Barack Obama, and the U.S. Secretary of State in his second term was John Kerry. And in 2014, John Kerry took a series of important meetings, uh, important trips to Saudi Arabia, where he met with the then Saudi King Abdullah. This is before King Abdullah died in 2015. And then after he died, he was replaced by King Salman. And then later on, King Salman's son, Mohammed bin Salman, the, de the crown prince, he had been deputy crown prince and he worked his way up and he purged his rivals, and he's now basically the de facto leader of Saudi Arabia. It's known that King Salman today has bad mental health problems and basically can't run the country. So King Salman is basically just a figurehead, and the real king right now in Saudi Arabia is Mohammed bin Salman, and he clearly has been taking a much more independent path for Saudi Arabia and trying to play Russia and China against the U.S., He's not obediently following U.S. orders. But back in 2014, Saudi King Abdullah was a U.S. puppet. I mean, he, he never did anything independently of the U.S. So the U.S. Secretary of State, John Kerry, took a series of trips to Saudi Arabia in 2014. And one of the main topics they, they discussed was oil. The U.S. at this moment was trying to crash the price of oil on the global market in order to hurt three, not only these countries, but three main adversaries, which are all countries targeted by the U.S. regime for regime change. And all of these countries relied very heavily on oil exports, Russia, Iran, and Venezuela. So this article in Reuters from June discusses how Kerry took a trip to Saudi Arabia. And the article is titled, Kerry, Saudi King Discuss Oil Supply, U.S. Official Says. 
It says, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry and Saudi King Abdullah briefly discussed global oil supplies during a meeting. During the talks, Kerry referred to recent comments by a Saudi oil official that the world's largest oil producer would increase supplies should crises in Iraq or Syria disrupt supplies. The Secretary, that's the Secretary of State, Kerry, noted positively a recent statement from an oil official in the kingdom reflecting the kingdom's desire to do what will be required in the event of any turbulence. And he said that the comments were constructive. So this is just the calm before the storm. Then what happened just a few weeks and a few months after Kerry took this trip, you guessed it, the price of oil crashed. This is a graph of crude prices over the years. And you can see that in early 2014, in, in February, March, April, May, it was around nearly $130 a barrel. And then by July, it started crashing. In the fall, it was in free fall. And then by spring, by the beginning of 2015, by January, it crashed to $60. And then by late 2015, early 2016, it crashed to $40. So again, it went from around $130 to around $40 in the span of a year, a little over a year. Now, this is not just the vicissitudes of the market operating. You know, the, the market is not some sentient being. This is a product of geopolitical forces, of political decisions that were made by governments. I mentioned that John Kerry, the U.S. Secretary of State, not only visited one time in 2014, he visited Saudi Arabia multiple times. He also visited again in September. And a key point of discussion in those meetings was the price of oil. This was all acknowledged in an article in The Guardian, a mainstream British newspaper that was published by its economics editor, Larry Elliott. Now, The Guardian is a complete mouthpiece for the British government for the right-wing neoliberal Blairites that control the Labour Party. And it's by no means, you know, a, a critic of U.S. foreign policy, but it acknowledges this fact. This article was published in November 2014. It's titled, Stakes are High as U.S. Plays the Oil Card Against Iran and Russia. Now, I think this article, probably better than any other single article, explains the strategy here and shows this is not some crazy tinfoil hat conspiracy. This is completely true. This is completely documented by evidence. This is what happened in 2014 in which the U.S. and Saudi Arabia tried to destroy the economies of Russia, Iran, and Venezuela. The Guardian, uh, the Guardian newspaper notes, Washington is trying to drive prices down by flooding the market with crude. It notes that the price of oil was over 110, over one, really over almost nearly $130 a barrel. But then the cost of crude collapsed. And yet, while the price of crude was collapsing, more oil was pumping into the market, which is only going to make the price of oil drop even further. It's basic supply and demand. If you have constant demand and you have too much supply, then you decrease the supply. If the price is too low, you decrease the supply in order to increase the price. But no, Saudi Arabia continued to pump more and more supply into the market which continued dropping the price lower and lower. Why is that? The Guardian newspaper notes, this is the Guardian, quote, crude could be used as a diplomatic and economic weapon. Oil being used as a weapon. Now, it notes that in 73 with the oil lockout, this is what Saudi Arabia also did in the other way by restricting the supply of oil to increase the price of oil, which helped to strengthen the US dollar, which had been depreciating against other currencies. And it helped really create this petrodollar system around the same time that was used to maintain US dollar hegemony. I talked about that in the other episode with Aaron Good. I have a link to that in the description below. What I wanna talk about today is specifically 2014 and the, or the orchestrated oil crash. This article in The Guardian notes that the Obama administration wanted Tehran, that is Iran, to come to heel. It also wanted Vladimir Putin to back off in Ukraine. Of course, in February 2014, the U.S. backs a coup in Ukraine that overthrows the elected neutral government and installs a Western puppet regime in Ukraine. This leads to a civil war that set off in the east in the Donbass. And then this leads Russia to intervene and it 
annexes Crimea after a popular democratic referendum in which more than 90% of the Crimean population, which were historically Russian, voted to join Russia. So then in response, the US and Western governments, European governments, they impose sanctions on Russia. And after the sanctions, the US responds by crashing the price, price of oil. So the Guardian newspaper noted that with the help of its Saudi ally, Washington is trying to drive down the oil price by flooding an already weak market with crude. As the Russians and Iranians are heavily dependent on oil exports, the, the assumption is that they will become easier to deal with. And then here, this article points out what I said a few moments ago. John Kerry, the U.S. Secretary of State, allegedly struck a deal with King Abdullah in September under which the Saudis would sell crude at below the prevailing market price. Below the market price. No for-profit company would sell oil below the market price. Saudi Arabia is doing this because at this moment it had a puppet government that was simply going along with what the U.S. wanted, using oil not to make money, but as a geopolitical weapon. This article notes that in the 1980s, Saudi Arabia did something similar. Then the geopolitical motivation was th that sent the oil price below $10 a barrel was to destabilize the government of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. So, of course, if Saudi Arabia and the U.S. used oil as a weapon to destabilize Saddam Hussein's government in Iraq, why wouldn't they do the same to, to destabilize Putin's government in Iran, uh, in, in Russia, or the Iranian government? or the Venezuelan government. The, the, the Guardian notes that according to Middle East specialists, the Saudis want to put pressure on Iran and to force Moscow to weaken its support for the government of Bashar al-Assad in Syria. And it's not just the Saudis. The Saudis are not operating independently. They are doing this at the behest of the United States. Now, this article, The Guardian notes that turning on the oil spigots comes at a cost. They can't continue to produce oil at such a loss for a long period of time. The Saudis, like all other producers, have, acome, have become accustomed to oil above $100 a barrel. Oil revenues financed higher public spending, so Saudi Arabia needs the price to be above $90 a barrel to balance the books. But a bit of pain is acceptable. The Saudis are gambling that they can live with a lower price of oil for longer than the Russians and the Iranians can, and that therefore the operation will be relatively short-lived. So they were going to try to wait, wait, wait it out to, to try to crash the Russian and Iranian and Venezuelan economies and wait it out. And The Guardian noted that there is no question that this new manifestation of Cold War muscle is hurting Russia. So the new Cold War in Russia that the U.S. is waging did not begin with the proxy war in Ukraine, at least with the Russian invasion in February 2022. It really goes back to 2014 with the U.S. orchestrated coup in Ukraine. And here the Guardian newspaper is saying Cold War muscle. That is the U.S. trying to sabotage Russia's economy and overthrow its government. The article notes that oil and gas accounted at that moment in 2014 for 70% of Russia's exports, and the budget doesn't add up unless the oil price is above $100 a barrel. Moscow has foreign exchange reserves, reserves, but they're not unlimited, and the ruble fell against the US dollar. So this article says exactly what I was arguing. Now, it notes that Washington's willingness to play the oil card stems from the belief that domestic supplies of energy from fracking make it possible for the U.S. to become the world's largest oil producer. This is in addition, so this is part of the same geopolitical strategy that the Obama administration was carrying out. Not only was it crashing the price of oil to hurt its adversaries, it was also increasing its own production of oil and gas, and especially through fracking. And this article noted that Tom Donilon, who was Barack Obama's national security advisor, said the U.S. was now less vulnerable to glo global oil shocks. The cushion provided by shale, oil, and gas, quote, affords us a stronger hand in pursuing and implementing our national security goals. So this is not just about economics, it's about national security, which goes hand in hand with economics.
This is what neoliberal economists fail to understand. Capitalism is not just motivated by some free market or whatever. It's motivated by the political demands and interests of governments. This article noted that the increase in oil supply has meant that any reduction in supplies from Iran or Russia due to sanctions can be absorbed without disrupting the global economy. So this was all an economic attack on Russia and Iran and Venezuela. This is not the only article that acknowledged this. Here is NPR, it's US state media. NPR published an article in October 2014 titled, Why Does Saudi Arabia Seem So Comfortable with Falling Oil Prices? Hmm, quite a mystery. It shows John Kerry in this meeting in Saudi Arabia, ironically on September 11th, 2014. This article in NPR US state media notes, the falling price is bad for oil exporting countries such as Russia, Venezuela, Iran, and Iraq. Saudi Arabia, often called the central banker of oil, is still the key player in oil prices. And this article quotes a senior fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, a, a think tank that has a revolving door with the U.S. government. And this analyst said, it, said this analyst said, the Saudis have shown themselves to use oil politically throughout their recent history. They're quite good at it. They think of oil as a strategic commodity and kind of their key lever of influence globally. Now, the Saudis are not just doing this alone. They're doing this at the orders of the US empire. They're, they were not, they're not an independent country at this moment historically, that is, in 2014. And for mo most of the modern history of Saudi Arabia as a nation state, which was largely created by the British empire, and then it subsequently in 1945, U.S. President FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, famously visited off of the coast of Egypt, and he met with the Saudi King Ibn Saud, and they made an agreement in which Saudi Arabia would help to maintain stability in the oil market globally, and the U.S. would protect Saudi Arabia. That was the agreement, and for most of Saudi's modern history, that was really what happened, although in the past few years with the rise of Mohammed bin Salman and Saudi Arabia's more independent foreign policy, it's become a more complicated situation. But again, we're talking about King Abdullah back in 2014. Now, this article in NPR, ironically, it, it refers to this as a conspiracy theory, a conspiracy theory, while acknowledging in the article that this is a result of a political strategy. So it's not a crazy conspiracy theory. Now it is, it's an actual conspiracy because actual conspiracies do happen. The ruling class, the capitalist class of countries do organize conspiracies like the 1953, 1953 CIA coup in Iran against Mohammed Mossadegh after he nationalized the oil. That was a conspiracy backed by the CIA. The 1954 CIA coup in Guatemala after the elected left-wing president, Jacobo Arbenz, after he tried to have land reform against the interests of U.S. Corpora corporations, specifically the United Fruit Company that became Chiquita. So those are actual conspiracies. The CIA's 1973 coup in Chile against the democratically elected socialist president, Salvador Allende, another conspiracy backed by the CIA. So this is not a crazy tinfoil hat conspiracy theory. It's an actual conspiracy. Here is another very revealing article in DW, which is German state media. It's called Oil Price Tanks. It's from December of 2014. The article notes that oil prices have dropped nearly by half since June. OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries led by Saudi Arabia, decided in November they would not cut back production despite an oversupplied market. Now, this is a, a, a very important detail because what I was saying earlier is that the U.S. and Saudi Arabia made this agreement to drop the price of oil. And Saudi Arabia continuously for months agreed in OPEC, which Saudi Arabia leads de facto, they decided not to decrease production because again, the supply is too high. The price is low. So if you want to increase the price, you decrease the supply. But instead, they said they were not going to decrease the production. 
because they're doing this for political reasons, not for economic reasons. They're doing this at the order of the United States. And DW quoted David Elms, the head of the Global Energy Research Network at Warwick University. And he said, quote, political and social tensions arise in producing countries that depend on income from oil and gas. Vladimir Putin has warned of harsh economic times in Russia. Venezuela and Nigeria are under pressure, and people speculate just how long oil export dependent countries can dig into their savings when they need $70 to $100 per barrel to balance the books. The article in, in, in German state media here notes, geopolitical aims are in part responsible for the oil price plunge. Analysts speculate that U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, who visited Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states in the summer, may have pressed the Gulf Arab oil states to overproduce oil in order to depress global oil prices and thereby weaken Russia and Iran, and also Venezuela. Jason Furman, the chairman of the U.S. White House's Council of Economic Advisors, expressed satisfaction at the impact of low oil prices on Russia. So again, this is the chair of the U.S. White House. Uh, this is the chair of Obama's Council on Economic Advisors. Quote, They are between a rock and a hard place in economic policy. The combination of our sanctions, the uncertainty that Russia has created for themselves, and the falling price of oil has put their economy on the brink of crisis. That was the chair of the White House's Council of Economic Advisors. The article also notes that this, is, this, was, this strategy helps the U.S. dollar in terms of U.S. dollar hegemony. The Russian ruble faced a sharp decline in tandem with oil prices because the Russian ruble is in effect a petro currency. The large majority of Russian government revenues come directly or indirectly from oil and gas sales. The U.S. dollar is also oil-backed, though in the opposite direction. As the oil price, price plunged, the U.S. dollar has risen. That's because the U.S. dollar is the main trading currency for oil. That is to say, because of the Western sanctions on Russia and because Russia, because the price of oil declined, the Russian ruble declined, it de depreciated in, uh, with the U.S. dollar, and the U.S. dollar increased. Why? Because there is more demand for U.S. dollars. Why? Because you need to spend more money on oil. And Saudi Arabia, at least until recently, historically, uh, it, it sold its, its oil in dollars. That's the petrodollar system. Because in the 1970s, the U.S. government made, after Richard Nixon took the U.S. dollar off of gold in 1971, ending the that part of the Bretton Woods system that goes back to 1944, in which the U.S. dollar was convertible for gold at, in the, at a fixed exchange rate of $35 for one ounce of gold. In 1971, Richard Nixon took the dollar off of gold. And then in the 1970s, the U.S. and Saudi Arabia made an agreement that Saudi Arabia would sell its oil in dollars, which means that qu countries around the world that need to import oil, which is many countries, they need to have dollars in order to buy that oil. So all of these economic policies and geopolitical policies are inextricably linked. DW notes that oil prices are of global strategic importance. The U.S. provides Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, the UAE, and other Gulf Arab regimes its military protection in exchange for a commitment on their part to accept exclusively U.S. dollars in trade for oil. This is the petrodollar system. The U.S. empire protects the Persian Gulf monarchies and they sell their oil in dollars, which is what helps to provide the strength of the U.S. dollar, the hegemony for the U.S. dollar, as the U.S. continuously has this policy of a trade deficit, of a uh, current account deficit historically over many decades. For many countries, if they import way more than they export and they have a current account deficit like the U.S. over time, their currency would devalue. It would depreciate against other currencies. The U.S. dollar doesn't because it has the petrodollar backing and it has the hegemony of the U.S. military. This article also noted at DW that Saudi Arabia's oil is cheaper to produce than that of almost any other nation and it has vast reserves. 
This enables Saudi Arabia to act as a, a swing producer, making more or less oil in order to affect global oil prices while still making a profit. Now, I mentioned earlier in this analysis that this, the situation has changed quite a bit in Saudi Arabia now with the new crown prince, de facto leader Mohammed bin Salman, and he has been trying to play China and Russia against the U.S. And the Wall Street Journal reported in March 20, 2022 that Riyadh is considering accepting China's currency, the yuan, instead of dollars in its oil sales to Beijing. This is a, an extremely historic development. If you know how powerful, how important the petrodollar is for undergirding the power and hegemony of the U.S. dollar internationally as the global reserve currency. I mean, this is a massive blow to U.S. political and economic hegemony. And of course, this hasn't officially happened yet, and it's still speculation. It's not known if Saudi Arabia will actually do it. It could be overblown. But the fact that they're even considering it is is incredible and historic. And, and it shows that we're in a complete shift compared to the 1970s when the petrodollar system was was really just ironed out. Um, and we also know that Venezuela has been for years now listing its oil and other currencies, including the Chinese yuan, also the euro. So there have been countries, independent countries trying to challenge the U.S. petrodollar, the hegemony of the U.S. dollar. And if Saudi Arabia, which historically has been a U.S. client regime, if it actually does so, this is a completely historic shift. Now, here's another article in mainstream corporate media. I just want to briefly review this just to show that this is an uncontroversial fact that has happened. And we can't understand geopolitics today and the economic crisis in Venezuela and the attacks on Iran and Russia. We can't understand all of this without understanding this U.S. strategy in 2014. This is an article that was published in Reuters and it was republished by CNBC. It's titled, Saudi Arabia is playing chicken with its oil. This article noted that Saudi Arabia is once again using its oil weapon. And of course, it's doing this in collaboration with the U.S. This article quoted Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro and he said, he said at the time, what is the reason for the United States and some U.S. allies wanting to drive down the price of oil to harm Russia and also to harm Venezuela? President Maduro pointed this out many times. This was a U.S. economic war being waged. And this article in Reuters pointed out that the Saudis were also punishing two rivals, Russia and Iran, for their support of Bashar al-Assad's government in the war in Syria. This article notes, Russia and Iran are highly dependent on stable oil prices. By many estimates, Russia needs prices at around $100 a barrel to meet its budget commitments. Iran, facing Western sanctions and economic isolation, needs even higher prices. Already, Iran has taken an economic hit from Saudi actions. On November 30th, as a result of OPEC's decision not to increase production, the Iranian rial, that's the Iranian currency, dropped nearly 6% against the dollar. The kingdom believes that Saudi Arabia believes it can protect itself from the, from the impact of the price drops. It can always increase oil production to make up for falling prices or soften the blow of lo lower profits by accessing some of its $750 billion stashed in foreign reserves. Now, here's yet another article this is an interesting article in the New York Post, which is a right-wing media outlet owned by the billionaire oligarch Rupert Murdoch. And this article was written by someone named Ralph Peters. He was a U.S. military officer involved in U.S. military intelligence. He was a complete neocon... I mean, he's still alive, I think. He's a complete neocon, a neoconservative involved in the Iraq war. And he also is this infamous figure who drew this map of West Asia in which he, he fantasized about carving up the region on sectarian lines to, in order to serve the interests of U.S. imperialism. Like he wanted to create a so-called free Kurdistan, carving off part of Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, he wanted, and Iran as well. He wanted to break up Iraq into Sunni Iraq and an Arab Shia state. He also wanted to create Greater Jordan and create an Islamic sacred state 
in modern day Saudi Arabia, and also wanted to carve off Balochistan from part of Iran and Pakistan to create a new Balochistan, which was another neoconservative fantasy. So this guy has a long history of pushing for these imperialist policies. And he wrote an article, an op-ed in the New York Post in December 2014, titled Saudi Arabia's Oil War Against Iran and Russia, in which he spells out the same exact thing. And of course, he, said, he says this is good. He celebrates it as something that's great for the interests of the U.S. empire. He notes that the, that the, the massive decrease in the price of oil is great news for commuters and almost every business in the United States, but wonderfully bad news for our ugliest enemies. If oil prices remain low throughout next year, the effect on rogue governments, he says, like Russia and Venezuela, will go from damaging to devastating. But Western economies, and also China's ironically, stand to benefit with cheap oil possibly taking Europe's snooking markets, snoozing markets awake. Now, Ralph Peters is, of course, very anti-China. He's a neocon, but he added China in parentheses because it's true that China does benefit because China is a massive importer of energy. So he's, he's not saying that because he's happy, but he, he, he really is against China and Russia and Iran and all of them. So he says the targets of this oil war being waged by the U.S. and Saudi Arabia were Iran, Russia, Iraq. And he says the winners, USA, USA. Also China, ironically, and India. And then other countries that were affected by this include Mexico, Canada, and he says collateral damage. I mean, it's, it was intentional. Venezuela was hurt and Brazil was hurt. And note, he refers to Brazil's government at the time as socialist. By, governed by the Workers' Party. Now, it wasn't socialist. It had a left-wing social democratic government. But again, this guy's a complete mouth-foaming right-wing neocon writing for Rupert Murdoch's conservative rag in the New York Post. And also, uh, Nigeria was hurt by this, this strategy. And this guy, Ralph Peters, they note that he was also a Fox News strategic analyst and former U.S. military intelligence officer. So here he's boasting of the oil war being waged by the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. Now, finally... I have one article, one last article that I'm going to look through here. Again, all of these are mainstream media reports. This is an article that was published in December 2014 in Reuters, and it was republished by U.S. state propaganda media outlet VOA. And it's titled, Saudi Arabia to raise spending, cover deficit with reserves. And this is, again, another clear example that Saudi Arabia was doing this at the order of the U.S., because if Saudi Arabia was truly concerned about bleeding money because its production costs exceed the money that it's making from selling its oil, then it would cut production and it would probably decrease government spending. But instead, Saudi Arabia was using its large foreign exchange reserves in order to make up for the, loss, the losses from the low price of oil. Reuters noted that Saudi Arabia plans to raise government spending 0.6% to a record high in its 2015 budget while covering a large deficit due to plunging oil prices with its huge fiscal reserves. The plan suggests Saudi authorities are confident of their ability to ride out a period of low oil prices. Some analysts believe Riyadh is content to see oil prices fall as a way to, way to squeeze out competing producers in non-OPEC nations. And of course, what they're not mentioning is that this is a political strategy to destabilize Russia, Iran, and Venezuela. So again, all of those articles that I just cited are from mainstream corporate media outlets, and it shows that this was a clear strategy taken by the U.S. government to use oil as a geopolitical weapon to destabilize Russia, Venezuela and Iran. When you hear people say that that Venezuela was suffering economically because of socialism and socialism always fails. Well, that's not true at all. The reality is that the U.S. government was waging an economic war on Venezuela. In 2013, Hugo Chavez died after very suspiciously contracting an aggressive form of cancer that many Venezuelans have suspected was because of a product of some kind of advanced new Technology, of course, the U.S. government tried to assassinate Fidel Castro at least 638 times, according to official U.S. government documents. 
And it's no surprise if they tried to assassinate Hugo Chavez. There was an election in 2013. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro won the election in, in a narrow margin. The U.S. originally, they refused to recognize his victory. And then in 2014, there was the beginning of a, a U.S.-backed violent coup attempt against Maduro to try to overthrow his government using violent blockades called guarimbas. That same strategy was repeated again in a violent coup attempt in Venezuela in 2017, and then in a violent coup attempt in Nicaragua in 2018, and then in a successful coup in Bolivia in 2019. And of course, the U.S. government backed all of those far-right fascist violent coup attempts under both Obama and then Donald Trump. And then the U.S. began imposing more and more sanctions on Venezuela, crashing its, its economy, which was very re reliant, of course, on oil exports. So the U.S. has been waging an economic war in Venezuela for years now, and it was not the, the result of the economic crisis in Venezuela was not because of socialism. So that's why I wanted to spend this time today going through and looking at this important episode in 2014. I really think that it's one of the key historical events in the, in the past 10, 20 years to understand geopolitics today, to understand the moment that we're living in now. We have to understand how commodity prices are not determined by the invisible hand of the market as neoliberal economists want us to want us to think that commodity prices are very in large part a product of the geopolitical situation internationally just as the price of oil has skyrocketed in the past year when the u.s and europe imposed brutal sanctions basically an economic blockade on russia including sanctions on many of its top uh, top companies including sanctions on its central bank freezing its central bank reserves which and, and Russia responded by forcing countries to buy oil in the Russian ruble, which resulted in a strengthening, a rallying of the Russian ruble. And then we also saw that with the massive price of oil, because Europe can no longer get oil from Russia and led to a decrease in the supply of oil in the global market, that the U.S. uses as an opportunity to increase its liquefied natural gas exports to Europe at extremely high prices. And Europe is buying this LNG, not because of the invisible hand of the free market, but because of political reasons. So capitalism is not a product of market forces. The market forces are a product of politics. That is how political economy actually functions. And here I will always be providing this kind of geopolitical and economic analysis. I'm Ben Norton. If you want to support this, my, the journalism I do here, you can go to patreon.com slash multipolarista. In the description below, I have a link to my discussion with historian and political scientist Aaron Good, which was related to this topic today, although today I went in much greater detail about the 2014 oil crash. And also in the description below, I have a link to with all of the sources that t for today, for this episode today, all of the sources I cited, links to all of them, so you can double check all of the facts, and I will see you all next time. Thanks a lot.